Hi. Hi. Talman. That's me. Yep. Hi, Hi everybody. Good morning. Uh, so, Talman, Juno, you are going head to head with the world's biggest unicorn, otherwise known as Uber. Why don't you give us, to start out with, your elevator pitch? How are you competing against them and why? Do we start with the how or do we start yeah. with the why? How. How. Elevator pitch. Elevator pitch? Pretend we're in an elevator. All right. Okay, well, a how big many one. floors do we have? <laughs> it's we're actually, a great elevator. <laughs> we're actually, uh, our office is in the World Trade Center, so I actually get more than a few seconds because it's okay. pretty tall. <laughs> how? Um, in a nutshell, we're going to be nice. Uh, we're going to be ethical. We're going to be respectful of our drivers. Um, we are going to treat them in, um, properly. And because we're going to treat them properly, they're going to treat um, their customers properly, the riders, and everybody is going to be happy. That's at the very, very high level. Do you think that's enough? So far, yes, but the proof is in the pudding. Where we are now, we have, we started recruiting drivers in New York in, uh, in December. Um, we are the second largest company in New York by uh, driver count. We have about 7,500 drivers. So you've got 7,500 drivers in New, York. in New York who are already using your app. Yes. However, there are no customers. How are you, how, who are they driving around? I mean, because we can't download the app yet, is that right? They, initially they were driving around completely empty, meaning there were no rides. We started a closed beta program in, uh, in February, which is ending these days. And so we're saying, you know, several hundred rides a day on the closed beta program. And we are moving now into a public beta. Okay. And so we'll be opening to a larger, um, uh, larger group of users. And these are not just any driver. All of our drivers are actively driving for Uber or for Lyft, typically for Uber. And they're all high-rated drivers. So in order to join Juno, you need a minimum of rating of 4.70. So this is like the maybe top 40% or so of the Uber driver population. So you're getting better drivers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, you're actually cultivating this idea of non-exclusive drivers. You want people who are working for other companies as well as Juno? Yes. Not necessarily. We, we're willing to work exclusively with drivers, but right now it would not make much sense for a driver to drive exclusively right. with, with Juno. But How are you going to keep them committed to you then? I mean, is it just going to be because, what, are you giving them a better cut? I think you are, aren't you? We're giving them, we're, we're doing a few things for our drivers. First of all, they, at, at the heart of Juno, there is this assumption that if you will be nice to drivers, everything will be okay. Because at the end of the day, this whole industry is run by the drivers. Mm -hmm. um, something that I, I think the competition is yet to realize. And we start by saying we are going to allocate half of the equity, the founding shares of the company, uh, to our drivers. Half? Half. So it's a really a 50-50 partnership between drivers and Juno. There's a whole scheme with RSUs that how we allocate these shares, but what's important is that drivers are not just driving, they also own the business. And so that's one thing. We give them better revenue share. Uh, we give them 24-7 phone support, which seems pretty obvious to me. I don't know why other guys are not doing. And we treat them with respect. And when you look at the ratings that our beta users are giving our drivers, we see that on average our drivers are getting about 4.93, 4.92. That's the average rating that they're getting. Uh, and that is because they are so much nicer to our customers. Are you teaching them that or are you just picking the good ones who are already inherently that way? I mean, how are you going to vet this longer term? I, mean, I can see how it's going to work on a smaller base, but once you get bigger, how, how are you going to control that quality of service? I think in Are terms you going to kick them off the platform? Do you give them a, you know, a sort of... I think it, we're, we're not looking at kicking off the platform. You know, one of the things that bugs me the most is to hear the way that Uber describes how they are 
removing somebody from the service. Right. They're calling it deactivate. Right. I know the term deactivate. I mean, I'm, you know, this is a tech form, so most of you probably know Star Trek. The Borg were using the term deactivate to deactivate machines. Yeah. Uber treats drivers like machines. We don't do that. Okay. We treat them with respect. Okay. So just to slightly change the subject a bit, you say that you're going to be giving them equity as yes. part of that, and half, half the company's equity is going to go to the drivers. How is that going to work as you grow, though? Because, I mean, that's going to really dilute by quite a lot. Um, what's, the, what's the kind of concept there? And is there, is there a, a way that you're going to make sure that you keep them committed once you give them the equity? Like, so for example, let's say I sign up, you give me a little point of a percentage. Then I stop driving. Do I lose my equity <laughs> or what? The, the way this is structured is we set up the company with a certain number of shares and a certain number of shares which were where in our reserve for drivers. So over uh, every quarter, we issue a certain number of shares, 25 million, but the number is obviously meaningless, um, uh, to drivers. And we distribute the number of shares between the drivers based on how much they drove, or specifically based on how much we pay them. So it's a pro rata between them. Now, in order to actually get these RSUs, drivers must be active for two years. Okay. So think stock options, think Got technology it. company, think retention. Right. But what about the diluted part? So you're in New York now. Yeah. Um, you're presumably going to go to other markets too, mm -hmm. right? You're going to conquer the US, the world, whatever. Um, how, how are you going to keep that from getting too diluted? I mean, are you going to cap it at a certain amount? Each the, market? the number of shares Always each quarter is fixed. So right. every quarter it's 25 million shares uh, for 10 years. Got it. So 40 quarters, 25 million, 1 billion shares. We, the founders, also have 1 billion shares. Okay, okay. Now, okay, since we're talking about money, um, we reported uh, about a month or two ago that you guys were raising money. You raised like something like 30 million. Can you confirm that? We never love to confirm fundraising, but okay. we're very well funded. I mean, okay. we're not as well funded as Uber okay. uh, or even as Lyft, uh, but we're definitely sufficiently funded to launch in New York, to, to run the service, to operate, uh, to do everything we need to do to achieve the goals of the company. Okay, but still, okay, let's say it's 30 million, let's say it's 50 million or something. It's still pretty modest. You'd say it's pretty modest compared to the like the hundreds of millions that Lyft or billions that Uber has raised, right? Like, yeah. uh, do you, are, do you? Is it possible to do that? I mean, can you actually compete on such a modest amount of fundraising? Absolutely. How? Why Look, is Uber needing to raise so much and you're not? I think that's a question you need to ask Uber. Um, I can tell you that I can also ask why does Uber need 1,500 programmers or so when we have 50. Um, right. I don't know. When, when we started Viber, we had, you know, 10 people and they had 2,000 and we did okay. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily about how many people you have and how many dollars. It's about what you do with these people and what kind of people uh, you recruit. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, if, you, if, you're, if you're a New Yorker, then it's virtually impossible to miss the buses. Every bus in New York now has an ad, join Uber, join Lyft, join Get, join Via, we'll pay you $1,500 a month. We'll pay whatever hundreds of dollars on referral fees and all of that. Right. We never a ton put, of marketing costs, basically. A ton. So far, we put zero dollars in advertising. We put zero dollars in referral fees. We never spent a single dollar on driver referrals. And we had all of these drivers coming to us organically. So I think if you can build something that drivers want, then they'll come. And if you can build something that riders want, they will also come. It's really about building a better service. Uh, and as far as riders are concerned, I, I like to think of about, about it this way. You, you have a piece of paper, you're going to the recycle bin, you have two of them. You have one that is uh, landfill and the other one which is, uh, you know, the blue bin for recycling. Which, where are you going to throw that piece of paper? Right. I would assume that most of us will choose the right one because it doesn't require effort. Our assumption is that riders are going to choose the service which is better because it has better drivers. It, it will have better options. And most of all, 
it's the service which is going to do right by the driver. And that's important, especially given that they don't have to pay extra for it. Right. OK. Um, so you mentioned Viber a minute ago. So you, of course, you founded it, you ran it, and then you sold it to Rakuten. Yes. It was a messaging app in a pretty cra crowded market for messaging apps. It did very well. It's doing very well. Um, what lessons would you say you've learned from that that you're applying here at Juno? I think the, if, if I look back at Viber, the biggest mistake that we made, uh, and, and I've never been shy about admitting our mistakes, I'm, I'm, we've made many, but the biggest mistake that we made at Viber was not launching with uh, a sufficient set of features. So we had the great voice product when we launched, and we added messaging only three months later. That was a mistake. Um, at Juno, when we launch, and we will be launching uh, soon enough, uh, we will have a sufficient set of features. So we're starting a beta program in, uh, in, in a few days. Actually, if, uh, if you're in the audience, uh, you can go to gojuno slash disrupt and uh, pre-register. You're going to get, in a, in a few days, an invitation uh, to join our beta program, and you'll get uh, rides at 35% off. Pardon the self-advertising. Did you guys hear that? Yes. You can, you Go can join Juno. Com, <laughs> slash disrupt. Yeah. Uh, and you can uh, try our service. Not everything is working as it should. They'll expect some glitches. This is a beta product. And this is just New York only, right? This For is now. just New York. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but when we launch, we will be launching with the proper set of features. So we will not be cutting corners. Right. What what would what would those what what do you consider proper features for um, customers for a driving app? Look, we we're we're not launching in a, it's not a green field. Right. So everybody here knows what the ride sharing app should do. Uh, you have the industry standard, which is Uber. You have Lyft. Uh, we need most of the features. You know, may, maybe I don't need the split ride on, on launch, but pretty much. Every single feature that is out there, and in our case, and then some, uh, will need to be available on launch. Otherwise, um, you know, you just you can't launch. Yeah. Um, so we will have a product which, and um, everything that matters is either comparable to Uber, and in many cases, actually better. Okay. Okay. Um, so in the pilot that you've been running. What, what um, hiccups have you had? Have you, can you give us a kind of update on how the pilot's been going? Oh, uh, plenty of hiccups. Yeah. Uh, I think the, fun, <laughs> the funniest one was uh, seeing somebody going through a toll booth, and then, I don't know if you ever looked at the GPS, but the, the raw data on a GPS is nothing like what you see on your navigation app. It, it's moving, it moves around. So you see somebody going through a toll booth, stopping for the the gate to open, and then you get the report that says they went back and forth through that toll like 20, 30 times. Oh. Uh, so you, you see a lot of things uh, w when you develop an app, which is why you do a beta program, right. which is why you fix these things. So is everything fixed? No. Right. Uh, but a lot of these issues are fixed. And by the time we launch, I'm, I'm sure that everything will be. It's fun. OK. OK. So. This actually also brings up another question for me, which is that we're seeing a ton of um, <coughs> transportation apps coming out. And uh, you yourself said that, yeah, you can build a good one on you know, tens of millions in funding rather than hundreds of millions, um, which also leads me to ask another question, which is, can, you, can I build a transportation app? Has it, have, have the stakes been lowered relatively low at this point, or is there going to be you know, you say you're putting in all the features, but it's going to be better. So what, is there a tech advantage, or is it all on kind of mind share at this point, would you say? I, I think, obviously, building it is, is doable. We've done it, Uber has done it, and many others have done it. Um, it's not trivial. Uh, it still will take millions of dollars. Uh, and it's a, matter, it's a matter of the quality of your development team. If your development team is so-so, will probably be more time and more money. If uh, you have a super stellar development team, as I'm happy to say that we have, we have an amazing team in, uh, in, in Minsk, uh, in Belarus, then you'll need less people, and you'll probably spend less money. 
Okay. But, um, okay, so, but, but, you know, with, when you look at the bigger companies out there, the Lyfts and the Ubers, they, they've kind of already moved on from this. Like, the basic transportation app, you don't see them kind of doing tons of iteration on that. They're sort of, like, going into the next phase, which is things like autonomous cars. Um, where are you guys standing on that? I know that in the past you've said, you know, that's been one of your kind of, you know, um, you know, your, your, your polls, um, that you, your 10 polls that you've been, you know, uh, campaigning on or whatever um, is is this idea that you know you're not going to make the driver obsolete because you're giving them equity so even when autonomous cars do come along you guys are going to be you know treating them better than the ubers who are prepared to discard the drivers so what what are you guys doing with autonomous cars and and how how would you potentially approach that in your business okay I think Autonomous cars are coming, there, there's no doubt about it, and that's pretty much the holy grail of every company in our space. The question is, for us is what happens then? Uh, and this is one place, uh, yet another place where we differ from everybody else. Um, if, you're, if you're an Uber, then on that day you deactivate uh, your drivers. So all that nice pitch about creating jobs and all of these things, they're like, bye. With Juno, while we may, as, as with everybody else, not require the services of drivers, because our drivers are shareholders, they still get to enjoy the fruit of their labor. So if you think about it, this is probably the first time since the Industrial Revolution that you have a company which may no longer require the labor, but that labor still gets to enjoy the fruit of, well, their labor. <laughs> Um, do you think that autonomous cars are really going to be a big part of this economy, though? Absolutely. Really? No, no doubt about it. Autonomous cars are coming. It's just a matter of time. I don't know if it's. Have you been looking at? Have you been looking at them already? Is something that you might start to look at? You know, for example, do you go to Tesla and have conversations with them at this point, or is that too early for you? I think it's too early for us to do that. Okay. What about, do you think that you would have to do something like what Lyft is doing, where it's partnering with large car co I mean, you know, they've, they've taken GM as an investor. Or like Uber, which is, you know, building its own program. Which way do you think that a company like yours would need to go? In this I think space? there's a, a lot of marketing and FUD in this space, if you look at the other companies in this space and what they're doing. That's my own personal feeling. Uh, are we going to be active in this? Yes, but right now our focus is not on self-driving cars. Our focus is not on the technology of 10 years from now. Our focus is on launching in New York, delivering the best possible service. Uh, it's not about um, even delivering pizza uh, with our cars. It's, it's not about uh, delivering goods. It's about delivering a great service in New York uh, to the people of New York and treating everybody, you know, with respect and dignity. Okay, but still, with the, with the autonomous cars though, do you think it's, how many years do you think it would be? Look, as somebody who's in this industry, I mean, you know, Lyft says is they're gonna do stuff within a year, I think. So, you know, they're gonna start rolling things out there. So, is that is that a realistic time frame for you guys too? Or are you gonna take your time and possibly come to it much, much later? I, I think, Look, can, can you take an autonomous car such as the one that Google is, uh, is driving, put somebody behind the wheel and uh, say, yes, I have an autonomous car on the road? Yes, you can do that. Uh, can you buy uh, a Mercedes S500, put it on the road and say, I have you know, some Mercedes cars in my fleet? Yes, you can do that. But let's look at the core of the business. Yeah. In 2017 or 2018 or 19, we are not going to have these services uh, driven by uh, by machines. That's okay. the technology is not there yet. Definitely not at the right price at the right price point. Right, but um, it is coming. Yeah. Okay. We only have a little bit of time left. I just want to ask you one other question. Why Juno? What What is Juno? I mean, we know the the goddess Juno, but what is your what, What's the reason for calling Juno Juno? Juno is a um, is a. <laughs> <laughs> Juno is a, is a protector. We, we look at us as the protector of the drivers. Ah. It's, a, it's a social mission. It's a social mission and a business uh, at the same time. Cool. Very cool. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.
Is that yours? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.